Hey there, Kazen here, and welcome back to Always Doing. So today I can start my quarterfinal blog for the Booktube Prize, and I actually skipped the quarterfinals last year because I had just moved and knew I would be settling in and traveling and other things that didn't work out, so I'm excited to judge it this year. I'm going to be judging quarterfinal group D in nonfiction, and I'm really happy with this group. I'm excited for all of the most of the books, and I'm really glad I didn't get group B. I feel very Oh, my heart goes out to everyone reading group B because it's like the violence against women group, the way that the randomizer worked. I don't have the list in front of me, but I think it had No Visible Bruises, which is about domestic violence. It has In the Dream House, which is about uh, abuse in an FF relationship. It has the book about um, the women in ISIS and all the stuff they had to deal with. And I, yeah, that's gonna be a lot of heavy reading. Good luck to everyone who got group B. That doesn't mean my group's a cakewalk, but it's not quite as bleak. To very quickly go over the books in the group, we have She Said, all about the Me Too movement. I have been wanting to read this. I'm excited to read this. Next is The Only Plane in the Sky, and I am... I really want to read this book. And I know that the audiobook is full cast, and it's supposed to be amazingly powerful, and I was a freshman in university when 9-11 happened, and I have so many memories from that time, and I'm looking forward is a bit strong, but I'm really interested to go back and see more of what was going on, and I would love, love, love to listen to the audio. However, the rule I made for myself is that I would read in text every single book, and that's not a requirement from Robert who runs the prize, that's not a rule of any sort, but I know myself, and I know that I am very highly swayed, that's a word, right? Swayed by narrators. And if it's a good narrator, I will rate things higher, and if it's a bad narrator, I will rate it lower. So I wanted to avoid all that by skipping the audio altogether, so I'm kind of sad that by my own silly rules, I'm going to be encountering this book as text instead of audio. But, you know, I can always reread it in a few years via audio and interact with it that way then. Next is See People, and I did a double take when I saw this book because I thought I had a really good grasp of what was nominated for nonfiction, and I didn't remember this. I didn't know this book existed. And it's about Polynesia and history and stuff. And this is actually the book I'll be starting with. It's the one I could get my hand on, hands on first. So there's that, but yeah, completely blind. For this one. Next is A Woman of No Importance, and I'm not really all that big on World War II stuff. If I do read World War II, it's gonna be nonfiction, and it's not gonna be battles or tactics or, you know, western fronts or the rest. So I think this one has a chance with me, and I don't know that much about it, and that's fine. I, I'm not gonna research stuff and spoil myself just to do a quick little introduction for you guys. I'll find out when I get there. The Heartbeat of Wounded Knee is a book that has been on my radar. It's a book that I've been looking forward to ever since I heard an interview with the author on, I think it was on On the Media, and I found it fascinating. And I need to know more about the history of Native peoples in the United States, and this is an own voices history, so yeah, this. And last is Trick Mirror, which is a book that I started on vacation last year, and I read an essay or two, and it was okay, but it didn't really go with the whole vacation vibe thing I was going for. I put it down and I never picked it back up, so I will be restarting this again from the beginning. And I have a lot of respect for Tolentino and her writing, but I don't, I've heard mixed reviews. I'm not sure how the essay collection as a whole is going to sit with me. All right, so see people first. Let's get to it. So it's April 8th, the first official day of the national emergency, and I am getting ready to go to work. Normally I would go to my hospital early, maybe get something to eat, hang out, but considering everything, I'd rather not hang out in the middle of the hospital. So I, there's this park right across the street that I've never bothered to come to, and it's quite nice. I'm enjoying it. <laughs> Stop it. We're new. Hold on. You scared me, buddy. You scared me. I'm glad there's lots of yummy treats. But that slithering sound got me. Yep, keep on going that way. <laughs> so, uh, where was I? I'm at the park. 
As you can see, there's a lot of wildlife. The bus that I took up here had the least number of people on it that I've ever seen. This whole part of the city is shut down. A lot of the stores are closed. So all of that's working and good. But I'm kind of sad because this may be my second to last day of work. They're talking and it's only rumors right now, but none of my coworkers or I have appointments for next week. And we figure that they're going to be stopping interpreting in person, which is good. But we haven't gotten any word yet whether we'll be moving to telephone interpreting or video interpreting. And I'm really worried about my patients because without interpreting, so many things can go wrong and they can be so much ugh, people's lives. Getting the wrong medicine. I mean, there's so many consequences of not having solid medical interpreting. So I'm really worried about that. And I'm also going to miss the excuse to be able to go outside and do this sort of thing. I really don't do well stuck at home, but you know, we'll see how things go. I just really hope that we'll be able to do remote interpreting because super important. Hey, Bella. Good morning. I love these. They're almost like a kind of beaded, bearded, I should say. Iris? They're just so gorgeous. There's a whole little field of them here. <sighs> While I'm here, I should probably tell you what I'm reading. I started Sea People on the way over here and on the bus because I'm only reading on my phone. I don't want to contaminate my Kindle because it has a leather cover and I can't see a good way to disinfect that. But I'm um, reading on my phone and so far so good. I'm going to learn about Polynesia. I don't know if I have much interest, but if it got through to this round and knowing how strong the field is, it's got to be a good book, right? All right, so time to go and listen to babies wail as they're jabbed with needles for the common good. Oh, you can't tell I'm grinning because of the mask, but yeah. So yesterday on my way home from work, I was able to stop at one of the last craft stores that's open and get some stuff to maybe play and make some masks. This is the amazing thing I was able to get, which is the elastic to use for the masks to go behind the ears. They were rationing a lot of this stuff, actually. The, the mask elastic was being rationed. This is something that they call setup tape, which is actually kind of like a wire that you can use over the nose. That was rationed. Um, none of the rest of this was, though. I have bias tape for edges. I wasn't sure if I'd be able to get the elastic, so I got some regular ties. I have an idea on how to use these. Thread. And this thread I can use for my normal sewing too, so that worked out well. And so I have this gingham because I'm going to be sewing everything by hand. I don't have a machine. And nothing helps as much as having straight lines already on the fabric. Excellent. I got a, but this is a little thin. And then I got a, just a neutral gray, slightly thicker. And I got this is extremely thick fabric and it has hydrange on it and it's, the pattern is regular enough where hopefully I can cut straight lines. So we'll see. In the store they were saying that even this kind of fabric can be too thick depending on which pattern you're using and they actually have all kinds of videos online about different patterns you can use and stuff. So I have enough of everything here where I can play. I also got yarn because I am me, and if I can make quarantine socks, I'm going to make quarantine socks. And I started them last night, which was day zero of my quarantine. So that's how far I am. And yeah, so thank goodness for crafting. Good morning. It is my isolation day five since interpreting has stopped and I've been able to stay at home, which has been cool. But you know what I haven't been able to do? get through see people. A bunch of things are going against this book right now. Some of them are because of the book, some of them aren't. One of them is that I am really in a mood for escapist fiction reading. I actually started the first book of the Anita Blake series because I really needed that. It's a reread for me. It gets me out of my head and this this is real. It's not even hard. It's not even difficult subject matter. I mean, she said is in this group and the 9-11 book is in this group. Those are going to be thematically difficult to read. This is not. It is a history of Polynesia. More accurately, is a history of how Europeans have thought the wrong thing about Polynesia for a really long time. And that's also annoying me a bit because while we learn factual things about 
Europeans who went there and discovered stuff, we also learn a lot about their wrong theories. They just thought a lot of stuff that turned out not to be true. And so you'll learn this stuff and it's presented mostly as fact. I mean, they say so-and-so thought X, Y, Z, and you go, oh, okay. And then at the end said, yeah, but they were totally wrong. Or yeah, but they were half wrong. Or yeah, they actually got, were closer to the truth than they thought might, they might be. But we haven't gone to the truth yet. And I'm about halfway through. And I'm afraid that I'm going to remember some of these crackpot theories way better than what is now accepted as how people got between all of these islands and where the people originally came from and all the rest of that stuff. So I'm going to make a run at this today and I'm actually bribing myself with the Anita Blake book. I tell myself that I can't go further in the Anita Blake book percentage-wise than I am percentage-wise in this. And this ends at 75% or so because it turns out there's lots of notes apparently. So when I finish this book, I'll probably be around 75% done with the Anita Blake and I can just rush through the rest of that and enjoy it, but need to get through this. I'm having a super high energy day. It's the kind of day where I would try and walk home maybe from one of my hospitals. Like, oh yeah, seven kilos, nothing. So I'm going to try and harness that energy and maybe work on my shelves a bit. There's not going to be a massive reorganizing. There's not going to be a massive much of anything at all. It just needs to be straightened and dusted. So here, let's give this a try. Thank goodness for the Doris finger snap because man, that would have taken a long time. Hi. So the footage you've seen up to this point is from April when I was filming all this vlog stuff and I decided fairly early on that I was going to chunk up my wrap ups because this has been the hardest part for me filming just with everything going on in the world. So I am coming to you now, not from April, like all the other clips, but from June 2nd, the morning of, in Japan, which is the evening of June 1st in the United States. And this is a moment I can't let go by, so I want to say Black Lives Matter. And there's so much work to be done. And there are so many things I could be saying now about Black Lives Matter, about the protests going on in the United States, and I would be here for hours and none of us want that. So I'm going to take just a moment to speak, especially to my fellow white people out there. I think as white people, we tend to be very good at performative allyship. We change our avatars in support of somebody, but when black and brown people ask us to do something concrete, we're awful at that. And so we need to actually do some work. And my personal philosophy is to do the work and not talk about it. That's what I'm most comfortable doing. I try to uplift voices from marginalized groups and if you go back and not from the very beginning of my channel but from nearly the beginning i made a decision that if i ever talked about say it's a tag video at least half of the books are by authors from marginalized groups and if you go back and look at my shout out videos at least half of the youtubers i shout out are from marginalized groups because the way that the algorithm works and the way that racism systematic systemic racism works, they're not getting the same publicity and they're not getting the same exposure and, you know, they're not popping up on YouTube as much as people who look like me. So I want to use my privilege to uplift their voices because they're wonderful and they deserve more viewers and just everything. So I want to ask or challenge if you like the idea of a challenge, especially my fellow white folk out there and as in anyone who has any kind of privilege able-bodied, cisgender, whatever, to examine it and to do some work, to donate if you can, to do what's in your capacity, because systemic racism is not going to just disappear. We need to do the work to get rid of it. So now back to the books, as weird as that kind of feels, but uh, the first one I finished was Sea People, and it's good but it's not quite for me. First of all, anything prehistory, it's not, I don't deal as well with in general, mostly because I think you can't tell prehistory through people's stories because there's no record, nothing recorded. And that makes it in instantly dry. So this book, which is all about the origin of the people in Polynesia, where they may have come from and how they got from island to island and all these other things, it's not a great, subject for me, but the author did keep me interested. And especially as the book moved on later, there were some things I found supremely fascinating, like how to navigate 
in between islands when you can't see the island and you're only using the stars and how do you get from one place to another and anything but the shortest hops and it is amazing because what navigators did is they conceptualized the world differently the idea is that you picture that the boat you're on isn't moving that it's stationary and basically that everything is going past you and you have a reference island it's not it could be an actual island it could be an imaginary island that you have fixed in your brain just off out of sight and you picture it there and then you imagine yourself like it rolling past you and how it's it's incredibly hard to explain she did a great job in the book i'm not doing it now but it kind of blew my mind and what cemented it in my mind is that there was a modern crew that went from i think it was hawaii and they went to i forget exactly which island an extremely long distance it's a voyage that takes weeks using no modern navigate navigational aids and just using the knowledge that was passed down through generations of navigators with the stars and all the other stuff and that made it that made the book actually that's probably the most memorable part of the book for me other parts of the book especially in the beginning because there's no written records most of what we know is from europeans who go there and what they saw and they're not exactly unbiased reports and they tended to bring disease with them and kill half the people that were there like there's all these problems but in the book itself it gives a lot of credence to these crackpot theories and i like it's been studied that for example if you want to tell somebody not to do something instead of like doing a poster that says don't do this with an x in it it's much better to have a poster that shows what they should be doing instead that if you have something with an x through it or some kind of don't do this thing people will concentrate on that and remember that more like that thing more than the correct behavior so i'm very wary <laughs> like the parts of books this book that have stuck with me has been that voyage and i had to actively try and push out all these really bad theories out of my head that the europeans thought as it went through because they're not right they're totally wrong it wasn't a bad read it was put together well the writing is good it's just not a me read and i had to drag myself to the page so it ended up being three stars I've been catching up with some of my booktube video watching and guess what like yay for that because I found out that tonight is cozy reading night Lauren over at Lauren and the books is doing one every two weeks while we're in isolation or quarantine or whatever shielding they got all new terms for it now and so I decided that I would it's like starts what seven to ten right and obviously I'm way ahead of everybody else because I live in Japan, but I'm not going to do it in the middle of the day because that's just silly. So anyway, I was like, okay, I'm going to read my booktube prize book first because it's probably not going to be very cozy. Um, I'm reading A Woman of No Importance and you're just going to have to trust me that this is it because I was very kindly able to get a review copy from the publisher. Thank you, Penguin. But uh, it's so good. It is so well written it reads like a thriller it reads like fiction all of those cliches that you hear when people talk about really good narrative nonfiction, and even just in the introduction the way that the author talks about um what an amazing woman virginia was and all of the things she overcame and how she was like james bond but cooler and i am here for this so the book that i thought wouldn't be very plotty or cozy or anything may just be my read for cozy reading night we'll see but um first i need to make dinner let's do doesn't look like much but tastes great a woman of no importance ended up being so good guys i finished it in four days see people took me like two weeks one more four days I blew through it considering everything else I, ha I had going on at the time. This is the book about World War II history for people who don't care about World War II history, which for, that's kind to me because I don't really care about all the military stuff. But the prologue of this book, if you are in, as enthralled by the prologue as I was, know that you're going to be in for an amazing read. And I was worried that she was overpromising because in the prologue she talks about Virginia Hall who is an American woman who went off to Europe to be a spy um, against the Nazis and to help coordinate efforts to get supplies to the French resistance 
and she did all of these amazing things. She was better than most of the men, if not all of the men, probably all the men, in the field with her and people, a lot of people couldn't deal with it because she was a woman and she faced sexism everywhere she went. And in the prologue, the author lays all this out, gives hints as to some of the awesome things that she did, all of the barriers that she overcame. She has a prosthetic foot in the 1940s, not high tech, like a wooden foot. And she still, it went undetected. Most people didn't know she had a prosthetic foot. Just like, and ugh, she was amazing in the field. And anyway, so the prologue, tells you all like hints at all these amazing things are going to happen. The author also mentions some of the lengths she had to go to for research between getting security clearances. She was able to get some documents unclassified. She went over to Europe and worked with documents there, found documents that were missing. So much went into this. And when I got to the end of that prologue, I'm like, oh, that sounds amazing. But what if this book doesn't deliver? It delivers narrative nonfiction that kept me glued to see what would happen, how she would do things, like it's just, and it's, she's a spy. So there's the constant worry of being outed and being in constant danger. It is gripping and I don't want to tell you much more because I feel like, seriously, read the pro prologue and if you're interested, you will love the book. So good. So a very enthusiastic four stars and instantly, obviously, above sea people in my rankings for the group. So those are the first two books I read. I'll be speaking about the next four in part two. If you have any thoughts about these books, I would love to hear them in the comments below. And if you just wanna say hi, but you don't have anything to say, that's fine. Just leave an emoji. And um, that way I'll know you are here. So thank you for watching. Subscribe if you're new. I talk about a lot more than the booktube prize. And uh, I'll see you in the next video. Bye.